I am Donna Young, the lead educator for the Chandra X-ray Observatory Education and Public Outreach Office. And this presentation is an overview of the Chandra mission, uh, the results and scientific discoveries over the last 15 years. As you can see, we are proudly celebrating our 15th year of a very successful mission. And this is the presentation that is given at the NSTA conferences around the country. And as several of you have indicated you would like to see this posted online, uh, that is what uh, we are doing. So you can expect one of these um, every year. We, it will be changed as, as, as it is updated with new observations and discoveries and posted on the Chandra website under the educational materials. And we are expecting and hoping to have several more years as the observatory is still functioning very, very well and still uh, producing uh, an enormous amount of really exciting and interesting science. So we're hoping for many, many more years to come. This is a graphic which shows the Chandra X-ray Observatory. It has all the usual components one would expect to have. Um, it's the, at the front of the observatory is the heart and soul of the Chandra uh, spacecraft, the uh, high-resolution mirror assembly, where the photons enter uh, the spacecraft. And then they are directed through the mirrors uh, to the back of the observatory where uh, the photons are collected either with the high-resolution camera or the advanced CCD imaging spectrometer. In between the two scientific instruments at the back of the observatory and the mirrors are two transmission gratings that can be lowered into and out of the focal plane depending upon what instrument is being used. The high-energy transmission grating is used with the spectrometer and the low energy transmission grading works with the high resolution camera. Other than that, there are um, the um, solar arrays uh, that, that, produce, that produce the power to run the observatory. There are some thrusters uh, to help position it. There are antennae for uploading commands and downloading data. And that is pretty much it. However, it's the most important part of this, of course, are those mirror assemblies. Now, this mirror assembly was an incredible technological achievement, just, fan, just a phenomenal um, uh, engineering feat. Now, Chandra went through construction and launch after Hubble did. Now, Hubble has flat mirrors. Um, you cannot catch an X-ray photon with a flat mirror. They simply get absorbed. You have to construct a high set of parabolic, hyperbolic mirrors nested together. The more mirrors nested together, that's how you increase the surface area of your mirrors. And they have to be constructed to meet the grazing incident of the incoming X-ray photons. So that the photons come in, they kind of skip along the surface of the mirrors, of all of the mirror surfaces here, and then they come to a focus at the, at the uh, at the very end of, of the uh, spacecraft either and are, are detected and captured uh, either with the camera or the spectrometer. The, the, uh, the alignment of, well, the alignment is so good on these mirrors because they had to construct a set of these mirrors before they would even go ahead with the launch to ensure that, the, that this mirror assembly um, actually would work. So they constructed it and when they aligned it, the alignment is so good on this spacecraft with, with the technology that the, when those photons hit, they do not vary more than one fifty thousandths of the diameter of one human hair. And the surface of those mirrors is so smooth, they have an iridium coating, that the diameter of that coating does not vary more than the diameter of two to three atoms. It actually was a fantastic technological achievement. Now the observatory itself is in a very extreme orbit um, because they lost two instruments and two sets of mirrors. 
they decided to put the Chandra spacecraft into a very extreme orbit so they could maximize the integrity of the, of the, sci of the science of the, of the mission. So it is in, a, in an orbit that takes it at closest approach to Earth. It's still 16,000 kilometers away and goes one third of the distance to the moon. And it's also highly inclined to the plane. So what that means is that unlike Hubble and the other spacecraft that are in that type of an, of an orbit, they go around the Earth once every 90 minutes and go in the shadow of the Earth during that 90 minutes. The Chandra Observatory has a 64-hour orbit, and it 55 uninterrupted observing hours outside of the Van Allen radiation belts. So they really extended the amount of observation time by putting it in this, in this um, configuration for orbit. Now, the, there are two onboard recorders, and every eight hours, one of those recorders, the, the, the data is downloaded to the Deep Space Network, either in Goldstone, um, Barstow, California, or outside of Madrid in Spain, or in Canberra in Australia. The, uh, that um, Deep Space Network is um, managed by the JPL in Pasadena, and so they, the, they collect the data, it gets sent along to the Marshall Space Flight Center, and then to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where the uh, command center is for the Chandra mission. So that's where the data comes in for the X-ray scientists, and that's where the commands go up to the observatory from the Draper Building on the MIT campus in Kendall Square in Cambridge. Now, one would expect that um, an X-ray observatory collecting X-ray photons is going to be imaging the really exotic, catastrophic, high energy, high temperature, millions of degrees uh, phenomena that are ongoing in the universe. So you would expect things like colliding galaxies, interacting galaxies, exploding stars, collapsing stars, black holes, neutron stars, pulsars, and all those kinds of things to be uh, the kinds of observational objects, deep sky objects, that Chandra is going to be observing. The surprise, though, is also that at the beginning of the process of stellar evolution, there's also a huge amount of X-ray energy being produced by protostars. Uh, this graphic represents stellar evolution, the different pathways of different mass stars. Uh, from formation to destruction, and depending upon the mass, uh, the mass depend depending upon uh, the mass of the initial uh, progenitor stars, that's going to determine what's going to happen to the star over its its evolutionary history until it ends up in in the end products with stellar cores and supernova remnants. Uh, over here in this protostar stage, though. It's really amazing the uh, amount of X-ray energy that is produced by protostars that where fusion hasn't even started yet. Uh, this is the Flame Nebula. Uh, it is a beautiful star formation nebula complex uh, with a lot of stars forming here, these small purplish. All of those are, are young stars that are forming in that nebula. Uh, this is the Orion Nebula. And that's also a massive star formation complex. And those are being studied uh, because it has been observed that if you have a star formation area, you have different mass stars being formed um, all throughout the nebula. So you have a uniform distribution of older stars, middle age stars, newer stars, all young stars, but some of them older as new ones keep forming all the time. It's been noticed that, that towards the edges of these nebula, that all of the stars are older stars. It's not known if um, these, the older stars are there because they've been, uh, they formed longer than the younger ones, and so they, due to gravitational slingshot effect, just kind of drifted and been uh, slung kind of away from the center, and so that's why they're all on the outside. Maybe um, new star formation only takes place in the center, um, maybe there are cooling filaments of gas that are, that are infalling towards the center of the nebula, and that's producing uh, new star formation. So this is one area where there's a lot of research being done right now as to how these stars form 
um, where they form within the nebula. This is the Orion Nebula, and which is within the constellation of Orion. And as you get further and further and further into uh, the uh, Orion Nebula, you come to the trapezium. These are Hubble images. Uh, you get to the trapezium where the massive star formation is taking place. A lot of star formation is taking place in the trapezium. And this is an x-ray image of the trapezium. And all of these stars here are fairly newly formed stars. They're between 1 and 10 million years old, new, astronomically speaking, that is. And there are a mass here of about 50, 30 solar mass stars that have just been forming, very young. And when you do a 12-day observation of this area and you look at these stars, you can see all of this flaring going on. Well, these are young, massive stars putting out all kinds of X-ray radiation. Hydrogen fusion hasn't started yet. These are too young for that. These are protostars. If our sun was, was that far away, we wouldn't even see any flares from, from it because these things are flaring 10,000 and more times more energetic than, than our sun ever has done. 